Hi everyone. Good day to you, wherever you are. And I welcome you to the finest music drama channel. Sharing the love of finest literature. Just lie down on an easy chair. Throw your cares off your mind. Think of nothing but the temperature of your drink. I hope you will enjoy today's dramatization. Your comments are much appreciated. Please support the love of finest literature by subscribing and sharing the channel with friends to get updated on future releases. You see, my dear Lieutenant, I understand your disappointment perfectly. You have been told in error that I am an intelligent man who in the course of his career has solved a certain number of criminal problems. <laughs> my friend O'Brien, who is fond of irony, must have exaggerated a little. Now, in the first place, I am not intelligent. It was funny to see the lieutenant as vexed as if someone were making fun of him, when Megray had never been more sincere. In the second place, I try never to form an idea about a case before it's closed. Are you married? Of course, replied Lewis, disconcerted by such a bizarre question. Uh, for years now, no doubt. And I'm sure you're convinced that your wife does not always understand you. And your wife, for her part, has the same conviction about you. Yet. You live together, you spend evenings together, you sleep in the same bed, you have children. Two weeks ago, I had never heard of Jean, Mora, or little John. Four days ago, I did not even know that Joss McGill existed. And it was only yesterday, in the home of a helpless old gentleman, that a medium spoke to me about a certain Jesse. Uh, and you'd like me to have a definite idea about each other? I am at sea, Lieutenant. For Maigret, though, being at sea is only the prelude to making landfall in just the right place, something that happens only when he fully understands the people involved. In one of these novels, Simonon writes this about that mysterious process. By the time all the characters had taken on the same human roundness, when he could feel them, the mystery would be very close to being solved. Maigret and the Killer. The maid tells me that you're Chief Inspector Maigret. That is correct. You are Monsieur Batille. Yeah, this is my wife. How do you do? Madame. If I'm not mistaken, you are the head of the judicial police. It's odd that you should come out at this time of night. Would it be about my son by any chance? Were you expecting to hear bad news about him? Not at all. Well, let's not stay here. Let's get into my study. Of course. Very well. Sit down. Have you been waiting long? Only ten minutes or so. Will you have something to drink? No, thank you. Have you had no uh, problems with your son? No. He's a quiet boy, reserved. Perhaps too quiet and reserved. What do you think of his friends? He has hardly any friends. He's quite the opposite of his sister, who's only 18, makes friends easily. No close friends, no friends at all. Has anything uh, happened to him? Yes. Has he had an accident? You might call it that. He was attacked this evening in the dark on the Rue Popancourt. Was he wounded? Yes. Badly? He is dead. Are you sure that it's my... Is this not his uh, wallet? Yes. That's his. How did it happen? He had just left a small local bar called Chez Jules. 
He'd gone about 50 meters in the pouring rain, and someone stabbed him several times from behind. Have you caught me? No. Did he die immediately? As soon as he got to the St. Antoine Hospital. May we go to see him? I would advise you not to go tonight, but to wait until morning. Did he suffer? The doctor says not. I don't understand. I just can't understand it. Antoine was a boy who didn't keep anything from us. And besides, there was nothing in his life to hide. He was... Oh, it's hard for me to speak of him in the past tense, but and I must get used to it. He was a student. He was studying for an arts degree at the Sorbonne. He didn't belong to any particular group. He wasn't interested, not even slightly, in politics. Somebody killed my boy. Why? But why? That's what I'm here to try and find out, madame. Well, why have you come yourself? As far as the police are concerned, it's just an everyday occurrence, isn't I it? I was almost on the spot. My wife and I dined with Dr. Pardon, who was called to the scene because he lives a few doors away from where it happened. I went along. Did you see anything? No. Didn't anybody see anything? An Italian grocer who was on his way home with his wife. I uh, have brought you the things that were found in your son's pockets. And, of course, we had to keep his tape recorder. The tapes will have to be analyzed in our laboratory. Oh, yes. It, it was his passion. You'll probably laugh. His, his sister and I teased him, too. Some people are mad about photography and go hunting for striking faces, even under the bridges. Antoine collected people's voices. He, he often spent whole evenings at it. He, he, he'd go into cafes, into stations, any public place, and turn on his tape recorder. He wore it on his chest. Many people thought it was a camera. He concealed a miniature microphone in his hand. Oh, once in a bar somewhere near Le Turn. Two men were leaning at the counter. Antoine was standing beside them and recording surreptitiously. They took the tape recorder away from him and removed the cassette. Now, do you think that that... Well, anything is possible, but we can't risk making any assumptions. Did he often go out uh, hunting voices? Two or three times a week. Always by himself? Well, I've already told you he didn't have any friends... He called these recordings living documents. Are there a lot of them? Maybe a hundred, maybe more. He listened to them from time to time and erased the ones that weren't so good. What time tomorrow, do you think? I'll uh, tell the hospital you're coming. Not before eight o'clock, in any case. Shall we be able to bring the body home? Not right away. Forgive me, Chief Inspector, but... I, I don't know when Minu will come in. Who is that? His sister... She's only 18, but she lives her own life. Hmm. Thank you, Monsieur Bettier. I'll see myself out. Uh, you're still up? Huh? You haven't caught a cold. Uh, I don't think so. I have the water boiling to make you a toddy. Yeah. Now sit down. Let me take your shoes off. All right. <laughs> Dr. Pardon told me and his wife what happened. How did his parents react? And why was it you? I don't know. They didn't take it in right away. It's only now that they must both be feeling the strain. Are they young? The man must be a bit more than 45. As for his wife, she hardly looks 40. She's very pretty. You know Milan perfumes? Well, of course. Everyone does. Well, then, that's who they are. Well, they're very rich. They have a chateau in Salonia, a yacht at Cannes, and they give fabulous parties. How do you know? Are you forgetting that I have to spend a lot of time waiting for you, and I sometimes read the gossip columns in the papers? Mm -hmm. A slice of lemon? Mm, no. What are you thinking about? As you said, they're very rich. They have one of the most luxurious apartments I've ever seen. They were coming back from the theater, still in high spirits. They saw me sitting at the end of the hall. The maid whispered to them who oh, I was. Come on, get undressed. Yeah. yeah, well, wake me at half past seven. Good morning. Good morning, Good morning, morning. Patrick. Yeah. Heard anything about the tape recorder? They're typing out the transcripts. I was afraid the rain might have ruined the machine. Any messages? Yeah, there's this. Meeting in the director's office has advanced three quarters of an hour. 
And the director would appreciate if you could give him a full briefing on the Batiga case. Are the reports typed? Just another paragraph. I think we're really on something. Just give me a more time. More here than well, well, the ladies and gentlemen of the press are early. Anything new, Chief Inspector? I'm just coming from a briefing in the director's office. Is it true that you almost witnessed the murder? I arrived on the scene so quickly only because I was nearby at the time. This boy, mm. Antoine Batille, is he really the son of Batille's perfume manufacturer? Yes. The concierge mm. says it was you who broke the news to his parents. Yes. What was their reaction? Same as that of any man and woman who are told that their son has been killed. Well, Have they any idea who did it? No. You don't think it could be a political killing? Certainly not. Well, Something to do with the love affair, then? Yes. I don't think so. He wasn't robbed, was he? No. Well, then? Well, nothing ladies and gentlemen. The investigation's only beginning. When it brings in some results, I'll give you the information. Have you seen the daughter? Mm. Yes. Who? Menu, the Batille's daughter. She seems to be well known in certain uh, interesting circles. Mm. Right. Yeah. Why? She has some very strange friends. Well, thank you for telling me, but I'm not investigating one her. One never knows, does Now, one? if you'll excuse me... Oh, well, just a minute. Wait, I told you we wouldn't get me. Oh, there you are, Petra. I've just put the work assignment sheets on your desk for signature. I want you to go to the Rue Poupancourt, mm-hmm. go and recheck Gino Pagliati and his wife, who found young Batille, and then go to Chez Jules, where he had his last drink. Yes, Petra. Is that all? No. Last night, I noticed the silhouette of an old woman in the window, second floor, just opposite Jules. Mm-hmm. Interview her. That's all. Ah. Hey, Graham. Hmm? Say the tapes are not too good? I'll send them down anyway. No, no, not only the transcripts. Send a machine down as well. I want to listen to them myself. <coughs> They're sending the tapes down with the machine. Make sure I get them right away. Migraine. Uh, Dr. DeSalle here. I have the autopsy report. Do you know how many stab wounds that boy had? Seven. Hmm. All in the back. All about the level of the heart, and yet the heart was not touched. What about the knife? Uh, well, I was coming to that. Uh, the blade is not wide, but long and pointed. Uh, in my opinion, it's one of those Swedish switchblade knives where the blade shoots up when a button is pressed. Only one of the wounds was fatal, the one that perforated the right lung and caused a fatal hemorrhage. The public prosecutor has appointed Monsieur Poiret as juge d'instruction. Never worked with him. Not a young man. Seems to me that for several years the legal profession has been renewing itself with disconcerting rapidity. <laughs> Isn't that impression due to my own age? Ah, here we are. Poiret only merits one of the old offices as yet. Ah! I'm happy to meet you, Chief Inspector Maigret. Here is mine, Monsieur Poiret. I uh, understand you have seen the father and mother of Antoine Batty. Yes, it was I who broke the news to them. They had uh, just come back from the theater, both of them in evening dress. I think they were humming a tune as they came through the front door. Ah. Was he an only child? No, there's a sister, a girl of 18, who seems to be rather a handful. Have you seen her? Briefly. Her nickname is Minou. How she gets that from Monique, I don't know. Uh, what is their apartment like? Very big, luxurious, but uh, bright and gay. A few antiques, not many. The whole feeling is uh, modern, but not aggressively so. Uh, they must be very rich. Uh, I suppose so. The uh, paper has an account of what happened, which seems to me to be highly romanticized. Does it mention the tape recorder? No, why? Does the tape recorder play an important part? Perhaps. Not sure yet. Antoine Batille had a passion for recording conversations on the street, uh, in restaurants and cafes. For him, they were uh, living documents. He led a rather lonely life. He often went out on the hunt like that, particularly in the evenings, and especially in the poorer districts. Uh Well, last night he began in a restaurant on the Boulevard Beaumarchais, where he recorded snatches of a domestic quarrel. Then he went to a cafe on the Place de la Bastille, and from there to the Rue Popancourt, the Café Chez Jules. So, actually, we have three recordings on the dead boy's machine. Yes, hmm? of which the first is a harmless dinner quarrel between a man and his wife, and the last an equally harmless banter between 
card players in the Café Chez Jules. Oh, oh, so that leaves us the middle one. Right. Let's see what it says here in the transcript. A, what did he tell you? B, that it was okay. A, did you go there? Emile. Emile, Julien, and Gouvion are taking turns in this weather. A, what kind of car is it? B, same as usual. Emile, don't you think it's a bit too close? A, too close to what? Emile, too close to Paris. B, it's on Thursday, seeing he only goes there on Fridays. This seems fairly incriminating, doesn't it? Well, it's obviously about a rendezvous for Thursday evening in front of a house near Paris. Certainly a weekend place where the owner only comes on Fridays and leaves on Monday mornings. That indeed is what it says. In order to be sure that the villa is empty, the gang is watched by two men who relieve each other. I uh, know who Emile is. He's a picture framer who lives above his store. I have his address. Ah, quick work. Well, the movements of a young man with an oversized camera out of the tourist season aren't too difficult to trace. I also have, uh, from a waiter in the cafe in which the conversation was taped, a good description of one of the other men. Description of a man with bushy eyebrows, sufficiently accurate that we should be able to narrow him down in our photo gallery to a half dozen possibilities. Hmm. We can then circulate the pictures. And in that case? In the last two years, several important villas have been robbed while their owners were in Paris. Almost every case of stolen objects were pictures and valuable curios. Ah. At Tessancourt, they left behind two canvases that were only copies which indicates... People uh, who know about art. Mm, one person who does, at least. Mm-hmm. And what's worrying you? That those people have never yet killed anyone. It's not their line. Mm, but it could happen. Yeah, let's suppose that they suddenly had suspicions that the tape recorder was working. It would be easy for two of them to follow Antoine Bettier. Once he was in a deserted street like the Rue Papancourt, all he had to do was jump on him and grab his tape recorder. In that case, what do you think? Well, I don't think anything yet. I'm fumbling in the dark. Oh, I am following that trail, of course. Two of my inspectors are watching the picture-framing store kept by the man called Emile. Others going through the files looking for the man of about 35 with the bushy eyebrows. Ah. Well, you'll keep me informed mm. as soon as I have anything new. Anything new from the Rue Papancourt, Janvier? Gino Pagliatti and his wife only confirmed what's in the report. Yeah. They saw the murderer strike a few times and then come back to strike once more. And in the Bistro Chez Jules, they noticed young Betty. Well, that's about all. But Madame Esparbez is another story. Madame Esparbez? The woman we saw in the window last night. Oh, room. right. She's a widow of about uh, 72. She lives alone in an apartment with three rooms with a kitchen where she's lived for ten years. Her husband was an officer. She suffers from nerves and says that she rarely sleeps anymore and says that uh, she has the habit of peering out the window every time she wakens up. It is an old woman's compulsion, Inspector. <laughs> what did you see last evening? And don't be afraid to give details, even if they seem irrelevant to you. I hadn't yet got ready to go to bed. I listened to the ten o'clock news on the radio, as usual... Then I turned off the radio and went over to look out of the window. I hadn't seen rain like that for a long time, and it brought back memories. <laughs> yes. <coughs> oh, but that's not important. Mm. At about 10.30 or a little before, a young man wearing a jacket came out of the little cafe opposite and he had what I thought was a rather large camera on his chest. Mm. I was a little surprised at that. At almost the same time, I saw another young man. You're sure it was a young man? Well, I thought he was quite young, yes. He was smaller than the first man and a little broader, but not much. Mm. I didn't notice where he came from. In a few swift steps, he was behind the other man, and he began to strike him several times. I almost opened the window and screamed, but it wouldn't have done any good. The victim was on the ground already. Then the killer bent over him and lifted up his head by the hair to look at his face. Are you sure of that? Well, I'm certain. The street light isn't far away, and I myself could vaguely make out his features. And then what? He went away. Then he turned back as if he had forgotten something. The Pagliattis were walking along the sidewalk about 50 meters away under their umbrella... But the man still struck the one on the ground three more times 
and then ran away. Did he go around the corner into the Rue de Chemivert? Uh, yes. The Pagliatis arrived on the scene then. Oh, but you know the rest. I recognize Dr. Pardon. I didn't know the man who was with him. Would you recognize the killer? Uh, not to make a formal identification. Uh, not his face. Only his figure. Are you sure he was young? In my opinion, he is no more than 30. Long hair? Uh, no. A moustache? Sideburn? Uh, no, I would have noticed that. Was he as wet as if he had been walking in the rain, or um, had he just come out of a house? Oh, they were both soaking. It took only a few minutes outside for one's clothing to be wringing wet. Was he wearing a hat? Uh, yes, a dark hat. I think it was brown. Mm. Thank you. I have told you everything I know, but... Uh, please, see that my name does not get into the papers. I have nephews in good jobs, and they would be upset if people knew I live here. Thank you, madame. Megrain. It's me, Luca. I thought you'd like me to make a preliminary report, Patron. Yes? I'm in a little bar just opposite the picture frame store. Incidentally, his name is Emile Branchou. He set up shop on the Rue de Faubourg Saint Antoine about two years ago. Hello? Uh, yes, Janvier? I have here 15 photographs of men who fit the description the waiter gave us. These are all I can find, Petra. Um, do you need me anymore today? It's my son's birthday. I'll wish him happy birthday for me. But before you leave, tell Lurti to take Neveu to relieve uh, Luca and Lapointe. Mm, right. So, you're back, Luca. Yes, Petron. We have identification for one of the photographs. Uh, Mila Julien Joseph Francois. Born in Marseille, bartender by profession, presently working at the Pink Rabbit. What's the Pink Rabbit? A strip club. He was sentenced four years ago to two years for armed robbery. Mila got himself out of it rather well. First of all, he claimed to be only an accomplice, and then because the thieves only used toy guns. Mm. Can one suppose that a man who used a toy pistol to stage a hold-up stabbed a young man for the sole reason that he might have been recording snatches of an incriminating conversation? <laughs> Uh, switchboard. Get me Monsieur Poiret, the juge d'instruction, please. Hello? Yes. Thank you. Uh, Monsieur Poiret? It's Meg Ray here. I have some information that raises a few questions. I'd like to show it to you. Half an hour? Thank you. I'll be in your office in half an hour. So, you see, Monsieur Poiret, the little gang of whom only Mila and the picture frame are unknown, are apparently planning a robbery in a country house near Paris. Yes, I see. But we here, on the Quai des Orfèvres, are powerless outside the boundaries of Paris, it's the domain of the Criminal Investigation Department. And with your agreement, I'm going to call on their Chief Inspector, Grosjean. The only difficulty is that it's out of our jurisdiction. Meaning? Even though Grosjean and I are colleagues of long standing, if he should apprehend these men... It could prove difficult for us to gain access to Oh, but surely murder takes precedence. Oh, of course, so... Monsieur le Juge, but with the jurisdictional entanglement, the men will have ample time to erect a legal barricade. Uh, of course, I'll make the necessary arrangement with the Criminal Investigation Department. But what are your plans? Switchboard, get me, Monsieur Poiret. Uh, you left a message, Monsieur Le Juge d'Instruction? Yes, yeah, I've tried several times to get you since. First of all, I must congratulate you on last night's haul. Oh, Grosjean's men did it all. I've been to the public prosecutor, who's delighted. They're bringing the four scoundrels at three this afternoon. I've heard the news this morning, but what really did happen in last night's raid? Uh, like the movies. <laughs> you seem to disapprove. It wasn't the way I would have done it. A whole fleet of radio cars. We followed the bartender and the picture framer to a rendezvous where they picked up their two accomplices. Then the gang drove to the villa 
A Golden Crown, Chemin des Acacias, owned by Philippe Lherbier. The leather goods manufacturer? Yes, right. They left Gouvion, a known petty thief outside as a lookout, and the picture framer and the bartender broke into the house with the unidentified uh, third man, who turned out to be a sailor by the name of Yvon de Marle. De Marle has a knife that could have been used to stab Batil. Aha, interesting. But you didn't capture the man you consider to be the brains of the gang. Well, that, Monsieur Le Juge, is Grosjean's problem. I'd like you to be in my office when I interrogate them, because you know the case better than I do. When I've finished, you can take them down to your office if you think fit. I know you have your own way of carrying out your interrogations. Have you come to listen to the interrogation of the gang? Why are you here, not Chief Inspector Grosjean? For heaven's yes. sake, I don't know. Ask the judge. You're in charge of the Rue Popincourt case, aren't you? Yeah, I have no reason to deny it. Might there be a connection between the two cases? Uh, gentlemen, I have nothing to say at the moment. But uh -huh. you aren't denying it. You'd be making a mistake to draw any conclusions. You were in at the capture of the gang last night, weren't you? Mm -hmm. I don't deny that. Uh -huh. Why? My colleague Grosjean can tell you that better than I. Oh, Did your men get on the track of the thieves in Paris? Uh, I'm late. Uh, please excuse me. Oh, oh, no, no, Inspector Maigret. How oh, are you, Maigret? Why are you here, anyway? Maitre Oue. Maitre Oue asks this question in front of the reporters and photographers, and he doesn't do it by chance. He's a wily lawyer who's accustomed to defending the big gangsters. Very cultivated man, lover of music and the theater. He's at all the first nights and goes to all the big concerts, which has made him a part of fashionable Paris. Why are we waiting to go in? I don't know. Hmm. How do you do, my dear juge d'instruction? I hope you aren't too upset at seeing me here. My clients... How do you do, Maître Yue? Hmm. Sit down, gentlemen. I'm uh, going to have the prisoners brought in. I assume they won't frighten you, and then I can leave the guards and handcuffs outside. <laughs> as, uh, as you know, Mitra, I must first establish the identity of the prisoners. Each of you answer when I call out your name. Julien Mila, bartender. <laughs> Emile Branchou, picture framer. Yeah. Yvonne Demar, sailor, presently on welfare. Here. Charles Gouvion, messenger. Here. Oh, just a minute. Uh, Monsieur Demar, I can't quite make it out properly. You were born in Campe? Correct. How long have you been a member of the gang? Excuse me, Monsieur Le Juge. It must first be established that there is yes. a gang. I, and... Uh, yeah, I, I, I was just going to ask you a question, Maitre. Which of these men do you represent? All four of them. <laughs> do you not think that in the course of the interrogation there might be a conflict between them due to a divergence of interest? I very much doubt it. And if it should happen, I would have recourse to a colleague. Does that suit you, gentlemen? Yes, yeah, yeah, very good. Very good. <clears throat> Since we are dealing with preliminary questions, I might say with questions of ethics... You should know that since this morning, there's been a great deal of interest shown in this case by the press. I've had a great number of phone calls, and through them I've obtained information that has surprised, not to say shocked me. Go on. The arrest, in fact, was not made in the way that is usual in arrests of this nature. Three radio cars, one of them filled with plainclothesmen, arrived on the scene at approximately the same time as my clients, as if the police knew what was going to happen. And at the head of this procession, we find Chief Inspector Maigret, whom we have here with us, and two of his colleagues. Is that not so, Chief Inspector? That is so. I see that my informant was not mistaken. I believed, I've always believed, that the territory covered by the judicial police is limited to Paris. Let us say, to greater Paris. Jouy en Josa, where we find the villa, the Golden Crown, does not even belong to that. He's got what he wanted. He forced the direction of the questioning, and Poiré doesn't know how to silence him. Would it not be because the information about this, let us say, this attempt at burglary, came to the ears of the judicial police? Have you nothing to say, Maigret? I have nothing to say. Were you not there? I'm not here to be questioned. Nevertheless, I'm going to ask you another more important question. Is it not true that while you were dealing with another case, itself a recent one, you chanced on this one? 
<coughs> yeah, Metra, please. Uh, one moment. Detectives of the judicial police were pointed out to me as having kept watch these past two days opposite Emile Branchu's store. Chief Inspector Maigret himself was seen twice in a cafe on the Place de la Bastille, where my clients meet from time to time, and he questioned the waiters and tried to extract information from the proprietor. Is that not so? Forgive me, Monsieur Le Juge, but I have to put this case in its true perspective, which is perhaps not that of which you are aware. Are you finished, Maitre? For the time being, may I question the first prisoner? Julien Mila, mm-hmm. be so good as to tell me who pointed out the Golden Crown Villa to you and who told you about the valuable paintings in it. I advise my client not to answer. I, I shall not answer. You are suspected of having taken part in 21 burglaries of villas and chateaux that have occurred under the same conditions in the past two years. Well, I have nothing to say. Nothing. Particularly since you have no proof. I shall repeat my first question, making it more general. Who pointed out these villas and chateaux to you? Who? It is obviously the same person took the responsibility of selling the stolen paintings and objets d'art. I don't know a thing about any of that. I don't know, I don't know why I'm here. I, I don't know these men. I was there looking for a place to sleep that wouldn't be too cold. Indeed, Monsieur Gouvion. Is that your point of view, Maître? I am in complete agreement with what he says. And I must point out to you that this man has no criminal record. <clears throat> has uh, no one anything to add? I want to ask one question at the risk of repeating myself. What part does Chief Inspector Maigret play in this? And what is Uh, going to happen once we leave this office? I I, I do not have to answer you. Does that mean that there's going to be another charge laid? I'm sorry, Maitre, but I have nothing to say to you. Please, ask your clients to sign the provisional report, which will be typed in quadruplicate by tomorrow. Uh, You may sign, gentlemen. Thank you, Maitre. I have made all my objections. And I have noted them. Good afternoon, Maitre. Good afternoon, Monsieur Le Juge, Chief Inspector. The officer, put the handcuffs back on the prisoners and take them to the judicial police. You may go through the communicating door. Uh, well, would you wait a moment, please, Chief Inspector Maigret? <laughs> What do you think? I think that at this very moment, Maître Hue is busy telling the press all about it and making it seem absurdly important so that by tomorrow, even by tonight in the later editions, oh. it'll run to two columns. And does that worry you? I'm not sure. A few moments ago, I would have said yes. I wanted to keep the cases separate. But perhaps it's better this way. If they stir things up, there's but a do chance... do you think that... it's one of these four men? I can't say anything for sure. Seems that a Swedish knife like the one used on the Rue Popancourt has been found in the sailor's pocket. Hmm? What are you hoping for? I don't know. The burglaries are Grosjean's affair. What I'm interested in are the seven stab wounds which took a young man's life. Good luck. What's going on, Chief Inspector? Yes. Nothing out of the ordinary. Why are those four men here instead of being taken back to the criminal investigation department? Yeah. Well, uh, I'll tell you. Yes. Yes, I'll do it. Uwe certainly told them there's a connection between the two cases. Instead of seeing them publish information that's true and false in varying degrees, isn't it better to tell them the truth? Antoine Bertil, ladies and gentlemen, had uh, one passion in life to record what he called uh, living documents. documents. On Tuesday evening at about 9.30, he was in a cafe on the Place de la Bastille, Mm -hmm. and as usual, he had turned his tape recorder on. Uh Uh His neighbors at the next table were... The burglars? Three of them. The lookout was not there. Now, the recording's not very good. Still, one can hear that a meeting has been arranged for the day after next. Hmm. Less than an hour later, on the Rue Popancourt, the young man was attacked from behind and stabbed seven times, one of the wounds being fatal. Do you think it was one of these men? I don't think anything, gentlemen. My job is not to think, but to get proof or confession. Did anyone see the assailant? Yes, two passers-by, some distance away, and a lady living right opposite the spot where the murder was committed. Do you think that the thieves realized that their plans were being recorded? Again, I don't think anything. It's a 
plausible hypothesis. In oh, that no. case, Batillo must have been followed by one of them until he was in a quiet enough spot and... Uh, uh, did the murderer take the tape recorder? Yes, did no. He? Oh, how do you explain that? I don't explain the it. The passers-by yes. you mentioned. I suppose you mean the Pugliati couple? When they started to run, did the Pugliati stop the man from no, getting No, no, he had only struck four times. After going off, he came back to strike three more times. So he could have snatched the tape recorder from around the victim's neck. So you're really nowhere. I'm going to question the gentlemen we have in custody. Together? Oh, one by one. Beginning with which one? With Yvonne DeMille, the sailor. Hey, doesn't he have a criminal record? Sit down, tomorrow. Uh, what are you going to do to me? Third degree? I might as well tell you right now that I'm tough and I won't let myself be trapped. Mm. Is that all? I just wonder why I could have a lawyer with me up there, and here I'm all by myself. Mets Uwe will tell you all about that when he sees you again. There was a Swedish knife among the things taken from you. Is that why you brought me here? I've carried that in my pocket for 20 years... It was a present from my brother when I was still a fisherman in Campay before I went in the liners. How long is it since you've used it? I use it every day to cut up my meat, country style. Maybe it's not very elegant, but... On Tuesday evening, you were in the Café des Amis on the Place de la Bastille with your two friends. Well, that's what you say. But uh, I can never remember in the morning what I did the night before. I don't seem to have a very good head. Mila was there, and the picture framer, and you. You talked about the burglary, and... You were given the job, among other things, of getting a car. Where did you steal it from? What? The car. What car? I suppose you don't know where the Rue Poupancourt is, either. Hmm? I don't come from Paris. Did none of the three of you notice that a young man at the next table had switched on his tape recorder? His what? You didn't follow that young man? Why should I? Believe me, I'm not that kind. The Confederates didn't order you to come back with the cassette? Oh, that's great. A cassette now. Is that all? That's all. jean Vier, have Laporte take him into an empty office. Uh, here, Laporte. Uh, take this one to 5501. Uh, ask the other three the same questions. I don't pin any hopes on it, but... It's still the most effective method. Magrave. Hello, Chief Inspector Maigret. Our editor-in-chief, Monsieur Frémier, would like to speak to you. Hello? Is that you, Maigret? Hmm, speaking. I haven't called to see how your investigation is coming. I'm taking the liberty of phoning because we've just received a rather odd communication. Two, to be exact. Go on. Well, you, you know we published the photographs of the members of the art gang this morning. Hmm. Under the photograph of the sailor, my writer had them print the phrase, Is this the murder? Yes, I saw it. What was sent to me is this cutting with one word written in green ink in capital letters, NO. And a letter printed in the same hand, apparently, referring to the story we wrote to accompany the picture. Uh, just a minute. Is the address written in block letters? That's right. The letter 2, as I mentioned. I suppose it's written on ordinary paper. Right again. Did you get a letter 2? No, no, no. Go on. I'm going to read it to you. Here it is. Sir, I have read carefully the stories printed in the last few yes. days in your, your worthy, worthy papers, papers on the subject of what is called the Rue Popancourt case and the paintings case. Your writer tries without any success to establish a link between these two cases. I find it naive on the part of the press to think that young Batille was attacked in the Rue Popancourt because of a tape recording. Besides, did the killer take his tape recorder away? As for the sailor, de Marle, he has never killed anyone with his Swedish knife. These knives are sold in all good hardware stores, and I have one, too. But mine was the one that killed Antoine Batille. I'm not boasting, believe me. I'm not proud of it, quite the contrary. But all this fuss tires me. And above all, I would not like an innocent man, de Marle, to pay for my crime. You may publish this letter, if you, if you see, see fit. fit. I guarantee that it is the truth. Thank you. Yours very sincerely. Of course there is no signature. Do you think it's a hoax, Chief Inspector? Can it be serious? Well, I'm sure it is. Of course, I may be wrong, but there's every chance that this letter was written by the murderer. Are you hoping the killer will somehow communicate with you? If he's the kind of man I think he is, he will. 
I suppose there's no point in asking you what kind of man you mean. That's right. At the moment, I can say nothing. I'll send someone to you to pick up the letter. Gregory. It's someone who won't give his name, Chief Inspector. Shall I connect you anyway? He says you know who he is. Yes, I'll talk to him. Hello? Do you know who this is talking to you? Yes. Do you know my name? Your name is of no importance. Aren't you going to find out where I'm calling you from? No. Why not? Because I'm not interested in that. Don't you believe me? Yes, I do. You believe that I'm the Rue Popancourt man? Yes. Are you still there? Yes, I'm listening. Has anyone brought you the letter I wrote to the paper yet? No, it was read to me over the telephone. Have you got the clipping with the photograph? It's with the letter. They're on their way to me. You do believe me? You, you don't think I'm mad? I've already told you so. What do you think of me? First of all, I know that you've never been convicted of any crime. Because of my fingerprints? Exactly. You're accustomed to leading a quiet, orderly life. How did you guess that? Don't hang up! Do you have a lot to tell me? I don't know. Perhaps. I... I have nobody to talk to. You aren't married, are you? No. You live alone. You've taken the day off today, perhaps by calling your office and telling them that you're sick. You're trying to make me say things that will help you to trap me. Are you sure that some of your technicians aren't trying to find out where I'm speaking to you from? I give you my word on that. So you... you aren't in a hurry to arrest me? I'm like you. I'm glad it's all over. How do you know? You've written to the papers. I... I didn't want anyone to accuse an innocent man. That wasn't the real reason. Do you imagine that I'm trying to be caught? Subconsciously, yes. What else do you think about me? Hmm. You feel lost? The truth is, I'm afraid. What are you afraid of? Being arrested? No. It doesn't matter. I've already said too much. I just wanted to talk to you and to, to hear your voice. Do you despise me? I don't despise anyone. Not even a criminal? Not even a criminal. You know you'll get me one of these days, don't you? Yes. Do you have any clues for my identity? Well, there are always clues, but it's difficult to assess their worth. I'm going to hang up soon. Now, what are you going to do today? Uh, it's the weekend. Are you going to spend Sunday in the country? Of course not. Don't you have a car? No. I think that when tomorrow comes, you'll spend the day writing a long letter to the papers. How do you manage to know everything? Because you aren't the first person to be in this situation. Oh? And how did it end up for the others? There have been different endings. Did any of them kill themselves? I don't have a revolver, and I, I know that it's almost impossible to get one now without a special permit. You won't commit suicide. What makes you think that? You wouldn't have telephoned me. I'm going to hang up. You can call me again on Monday. Not tomorrow. Tomorrow's Sunday. I shan't be in my office. You won't be at home? I'm planning to go to the country with my wife. Are you very hungry? Just ordinarily hungry. Are you worried? Not really. Antoine Batil's killer called me. Out of bravado or defiance? Neither. He needed reassurance. And he turned to you? Well, there isn't anyone else he could use. Are you sure he's the murderer? I said the killer. A murder presumes premeditation. And his act was not premeditated? Not exactly, unless I'm mistaken. Why did he write to the papers? You've read his letter? Well, yes, I thought at first it was a joke. Do you know who he is? No. Well, can you find him? Oh, he'll give himself up of his own accord. And if he doesn't give himself up? If he commits another crime... He won't kill again. After all, it's himself he's afraid of. Didn't it give you a funny feeling listening to his voice on the telephone? Well, after 40 years in this job, I'm always affected when I meet a man who was killed. Oh. Why? Because he has crossed the barrier. 
The man who kills cuts himself off from human society. Mm. From one minute to the next, he ceases to be a man like other men. Even the real killers, the professionals, mm. oh, yes, they look aggressive and sardonic because they need to swagger to make themselves believe that they still exist as men. Mm. Now, I'm sure he'll phone me again tomorrow. All four of them are in the Sante prison. And there's another letter to the editor. Here. Ah, so our killer behaved himself over the weekend. Sir, I have read your latest the stories, stories Saturdays Saturday. in particular, and although I am not able to judge their literary value, I have the impression that you are really looking for the truth. I have, however, one complaint to make to you. In your last piece, you speak of the madman of the Rue Popancourt. Why this word, which first of all is hurtful and secondly makes a judgment? Do you know that you can do a lot of harm by using words of that kind? I don't ask to be treated with kid gloves. I know that in everyone's eyes I'm a killer. But I would prefer not to be annoyed by words that are probably stronger than the intention of those who use them. Apart from that, I must thank you for your objectivity. I can tell you that I have telephoned Chief Inspector Maigret. He seemed to me to be very understanding. I... I want to trust him. But how far does his profession oblige him to play a part, let alone set traps? I think I shall telephone him again. I feel very tired. Tomorrow, however, I shall go back to work. I went to Antoine Batille's funeral. I saw his father, his mother, and his sister... I want them to know that I had nothing against their son. I didn't even, even know him. him. I had never seen him before. I am truly sorry for the evil I have done them. Yours very sincerely. Negre. Were you waiting for me? I was just going out. Didn't you know I would phone? Yes, I did. Oh. Huh? Yeah. Anything new, jean -Vier? Nothing new, Patrick. Uh, sit down. He called me again. He hasn't decided to give himself up. No, he wants to. Still hesitating, as one might hesitate to jump into icy water. I suppose he trusts you. I think so. But he knows I'm not on my own. I've just come down from upstairs. When the juge d'instruction begins to question him, he'll unfortunately have to face reality. <laughs> Don't we all, Petro? I know a little more about him. Comes from a small town... Didn't want to tell me which one. That means that it's a very small town where we would have no difficulty in picking up his trail. His father is a chief accountant, a man who can be trusted, as he says, not without bitterness. I can understand that. I know the type. He wanted to turn him into a lawyer or a doctor. He didn't have what it takes to go on with his studies, nor did he want to go into the same company as, as his father. Nothing original in that, as I told him. Works in an office, lives alone, has a reason for not getting married. Did he tell you what it was? No, but I think I can guess. I can't do anything but wait. Are you hoping that... Hey, Gray. Hello, Monsieur Magray. I'm, I'm sorry I hung up on you earlier. There are times when I think that nothing has any meaning anymore. I'm like a fly beating against a windowpane trying to escape from the four walls of a room. You aren't in your office? Oh, I, I went there. I, I was full of good intentions gave me an important file to take care of. When I opened it and read the first lines, I asked myself what I was doing there. I was seized by a kind of panic, and under the pretext of going to the washroom, I went down the corridor. I, I barely took the time to grab my raincoat and hat from the hook as I went by. I was afraid someone would catch me. I felt as if I was being pursued. Where are you? On the Grand Boulevard. Have you been drinking? How did you know? I've had two or three brandies. You don't usually drink? Only a glass of wine with meals. Really a drink by itself. Do you smoke? No. What are you going to do now? I don't know. Nothing. Walk. Uh, I might sit in a cafe and read the afternoon papers. Why don't you come and see me? <laughs> Would you let me leave again? I couldn't promise you that. Well, I'll come and see you, as you say, when I've made a final decision. Goodbye, Chief Inspector. Goodbye. Don't let it get you down. 
Poor man. He's still fighting himself. He's quite lucid. He isn't cherishing any illusions. Did you get the impression that he's begun to waver? Oh, he's been wavering since he wrote to the newspaper. Just now he's outside in the sunlight in the crowd where nobody takes notice of him. He can go into a cafe and order a brandy and they'll serve him without paying any attention to him. He can go and have dinner in a restaurant or sit in the darkness of a movie house. I know what you mean. I only hope he doesn't keep on drinking. Well, let's us go and have a drink, then go home. He's here. No, are you sure it's him? Well, he told me so himself. Has he been here long? Almost an hour. Weren't you afraid? Well, I knew I wasn't in any danger. We talked. What about? Everything. Spring, Paris, the little truck driver's restaurants, which are disappearing now. Good evening. Oh, forgive me for coming here. I, I was afraid that over there at your office, they, they, they wouldn't let me see you right away. Ah, oh, yes. You're just as I imagined you'd be. Hmm. Sit down. Hmm. Your wife has been very patient with me. Oh, here's my knife. You can have the blood analyzed. I haven't cleaned it. Well, I... I don't know how to begin. Well, I'll start by asking you a few questions. What's your name? Robert Bureau. Where do you come from? From saint amand montron We lived in a small house near the Berry Canal. My parents live there still. Mm -hmm. Were you uh, good at school? Would you believe until I was 14 and a half I was at the top of the class? My parents were so used to it that they scolded me if I had one mark less than perfect. When did you start to be I afraid? I don't know how I've been able to keep the secret until now. What happened when you were 14 and a half? Do you know that region? I've been through it. The share runs parallel to the canal. The banks are covered with rushes, with willows, with bushes of all kinds. That's where the local children usually go to play. Some of them used to swim in the river stark naked. I didn't play with them. Why not? My mother used to call them little hoodlums. Almost all of them were the children of workers, and my parents made a great distinction between wage earners and white-collar employees. One of them, René, was about 13, was very well developed for her age. I was in love with her. One boy, the butcher's son, made love to her in the bushes. I caught them. They went to swim with the others. At one moment, he moved away from the others. He came close to me without knowing it. And I took my knife out of my pocket. I released the catch, and the blade flicked out. I swear I didn't know what I was doing. I struck several times, and I felt as if I was... Freeing myself from something. They only discovered him two hours later. They hadn't noticed he wasn't with the group of children anymore. How was it you had this knife when you were so young? I stole it from one of my uncles. My uncle looked for it everywhere without even thinking of me. Mm. Didn't anyone suspect you? No, that's what surprised me. They thought of all possible suspects except a child. Well, I kept on going to school. And then I became disoriented. My marks got lower and lower. And soon I, I didn't feel as if I belonged to the real world. I wanted to run away. Oh, not to run away from any possible punishment, but just to get away from my parents. When did you realize what had happened to you? You do believe me, don't you? I believe you. And here I've always thought that no one would believe me. How old were you when you left saint Amand? Seventeen. Oh, I knew I'd never pass my exams. My father couldn't understand. He worried about me. One night I went off without saying anything, taking with me a suitcase and what little I'd saved. And your knife? Yes. Oh, I've meant to get rid of it hundreds of times. I could never bring myself to do it. I don't know why. You see, Have I... Have you had any girlfriends... No. I realized I... I had no right to get married. My dear, would you step into the kitchen? Mm, yes. Yeah. Excuse me. 
Dinner's ready. It's after eight. What shall we do? What do you mean? We have to eat. We haven't finished. Well, perhaps he could join us. Oh, no, 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 no. There mustn't be a properly set table. No family dinner. That would make him feel terribly ill at ease. Have you any uh, cold cuts, cheese? Oh, yes, of course. Um, make some sandwiches. Bring them into us with a bottle of white wine. Oh, what's he like? Calmer and more lucid than I'd thought he'd be. I'm beginning to understand why he took so long to come in. He needed to step back to see things in perspective. See what thing? Himself. Did you hear any of what he said? No. When he was fourteen and a half, he killed a boy. Oh, I'm keeping you from your dinner, aren't I? If we were at the Kitas Arfev, I'd send out for sandwiches and beer. There's no reason why I shouldn't do the same here. My wife is making sandwiches for us. She'll bring them in with a bottle of white wine. If only I had known. You'd known what? That someone could understand me. But you must be an exception. The juge won't have the same attitude or the jury. And I was afraid I might have been wrong about you. Oh, I'd read in the papers that you were human and that you sometimes went against the public prosecutor's office. But on the other hand, I've heard of your interrogations keyed to get a confession. You treat the prisoner gently and kindly to make him feel at ease, and he doesn't realize you're dragging it all out of him. Not all cases are the same. When I telephoned you, I weighed every one of your words, every one of your silences. I hope this will do. You came in the end, though, eh? Uh, help yourself. I no longer had any choice. I felt my whole world was falling apart. Look, wait. I'll make you a confession. Yesterday, at one particular moment on the Grand Boulevard, I had the idea of attacking somebody, anybody, in the middle of a crowd, of striking out all around me savagely in the hope that someone would kill me. May I pour myself another glass of wine? I shan't drink any more wine like that for the rest of my life. Please do. There were three days of torrential rain... Oh, they, they often talk about the moon and its effect on people like me. But I watched myself. I didn't notice my impulses were stronger or more frequent at the time of the full moon. It's rather a, a certain intensity of the weather that has an effect. You might say that nature has a period of crisis and... Can you understand that rain that went on incessantly, the squalls, the sound of the wind rattling the shutters of my room, all that combined to put my nerves on edge... In the evening, I went out and began to walk in the storm. I, I walked and walked. At one particular moment, my hand gripped the knife in my pocket. I saw the lights of a little bar in a dark street. A young man in a light-colored jacket came out, his long hair plastered to his neck, and... and the trigger was released. I didn't know him. I'd never seen him before. I hadn't seen his face. I struck at him several times. And then as I was going away... I realized that I hadn't yet reached the moment of release, and I went back to strike him again and to lift up his head. And that's why they talked about a madman. I really am mad, am I not? If only I could be given treatment. That's what I've been hoping for for so long. But you will see. They'll just send me to a prison for life. Well, aren't you going to say anything? I hope they'll give you treatment. But you wouldn't count too much on it, would you? Drink up. We'd better go straight to the Quai des Orfèvres. Megre and the Killer by Frederick Sperling with production and direction by Peter Donkin. Bud Knapp starred as the chief inspector and Warren Wilson was heard as Robert. The other performers, Jack Anthony, Jim Barron, Len Berman, Eve Crawford, Alan Dorinus, Ron Hartman, Alice Hill, Frank Perry, John Scott, Sandra Scott, and Aileen Satan. Signature music by Lucio Agostini. Sound effects, Bill Robinson. Technical Operation, David Dobbs and Derek Stubbs. This is Andrew Marshall speaking. <laughs> <laughs>